Hello, Stefan here with Liquidity with a brief history of the German language. Yes, I'm going to try to keep it brief. Maybe that's a fool's errand. I know I will pass over and not mention a lot of things that could be mentioned, a lot of details. If there's something you want to add, please feel free to add it in the comment section. Liquidity. There's no one specific time in the history of Germany or in the history of Europe that can be identified as the beginning of the German language. The German language is really one of many languages that belong to a large family of languages. It is, among all the other Germanic languages, part of the Indo-European language family. And languages, of course, evolve. Languages change and sometimes they split off. Sometimes dialects become their own languages or are acknowledged to be a language in and of themselves. Often we define ourselves in contrast to others and that is certainly true with, with, with German and Germany and Germans. If one had to identify certain stages, certain time periods of the creation or of the history of the German language, it might look something like this. So first of all, there's the Proto-Germanic time period, which lasted roughly up until the early Middle Ages. Let's say Middle Ages, late antiquity, kind of uh, what sometimes people refer to as the Dark Ages. During the Proto-Germanic time period, if we can call it that, speakers of the dialects that would eventually morph into what we know as German today lived maybe side by side, at least not very far away from speakers of other languages, mostly Germanic languages and dialects. If we look at this relatively old map here, we can see where ancient historians, Greeks and Romans, thought that the Germanic people lived. And this is a very large area all over Central, even East Central Europe, right? And in Northern Europe as well. So this is kind of like a, not melting pot, but really a very, very large area where many, many different kinds of tribes that had certain things in common in terms of religion, in terms of culture, in terms of language uh, resided at that point of history. Linguistically, the biggest change from Proto-Germanic to what would be the next stage would be what would be actually early High German would be the consonant shifts. So there are certain consonants that shifted. That's the reason why in English we would say ship and Germany would say schiff, or in English we would say apple, in German we would say apfel, or we would say in English, weapon, when in German we say Waffe. So very often P's turned into F sounds or into F sounds. Another big change is that High German lost its F sound or the sound. So these dental fricatives. So German lost those dental fricatives that are still so common in English with V or F. This is also the time period of the great migrations of Germanic people. So around 500, the 5th century AD, the Western Roman Empire crumbled and Germanic people who had been like pent up by the, 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 the Roman border all of a sudden were able to infiltrate the relatively well-to-do, relatively wealthy Western Roman Empire. This is why we have Germanic people in Britain, why English is a Germanic language, because people from what is today Northern Germany brought their low German dialects over to Britain, and that forms the basis, the very basis of English today. So the entire former Western Roman Empire was flooded more or less by, by mostly Germanic people, but also some other groups, like for instance, the Huns, they came in. And as those Germanic people moved westwards, Slavic people moved into areas that were formerly occupied by, by German tribes. Most notably of all these people, and especially important for German history, 
are the Franks. The Franks were not just one tribe. They were really a confederation of various tribes that at one point lived in what is today north-central Germany. The Franks were already to some extent Romanized. To some extent, the Franks even went into battle with the Romans against some common enemies or, or simply as mercenaries. So when the Roman Empire crumbled in the western part of the Roman Empire, and the Franks poured into these areas, they were already very familiar with Roman ways of doing things. Some of them were also literate in the Roman language, Latin, and uh, they basically took over that part of West Central Europe. By the year 800, the Franks had expanded their empire, their kingdom so far that basically all of West Central Europe, including Northern Italy, was under their control. They were the most powerful ancient kingdom during that time period. And in the year 800, something very important happened. Pope Leo dubbed Charlemagne the Roman Emperor, even though the Roman Empire, at least in the western part of Europe, had ceased to exist long uh, before that, centuries before that. Now, why is it important that the Pope announced Charlemagne as the Roman Emperor, even though there was no Roman Empire left? Because this was the very beginning of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, which is really the political name or the political identity of Germany for almost a thousand years. So in the year 843, the Frankish Empire was split up between three of Charlemagne's grandsons. So the core area of the Franks, especially the upper two-thirds of the Rhine River and its tributaries, formed the basis of what we can identify as modern German today. Those areas were really the core areas of Frankish power. And also, those were the areas where in the Middle Ages, we see literature coming about, where people actually start to write in the vernacular, in the language of the people. So these years of the Frankish Empire, and then Frankish Empire splitting into three kingdoms and the eastern portion of it becoming the very early form of Germany, really, even though people didn't really think of it that way back then, that was the period of Old High German. And why is it called High German? Because the language in which early German literature was written was really the language spoken by people at higher elevations, up on the Rhine River, right, and its tributaries, basically Southern German. And later that moved a little bit further north, but basically we could say that the central and southern German dialects really form the basis of what we know today, or are the ancestors of what we know today as High German or Standard German, in comparison and in contrast to Northern German dialects, Low German. Low German, by the way, is the ancestor of English. So English is actually a uh, derivative or, or a descendant of Low German dialects. So the Old High German period was roughly between 600 and 1050, and then the Middle High German period, the next period, uh, was roughly between 1050 and 1350. And the main difference between those periods is that in the later period, in the Middle High German period, people really started to write in the vernacular, in the, in the Vulgate, in the, in, the, in the language of the people. By the way, the very name for German in the German language, Deutsch, has its origin in a word that simply means people or off the people, by the people, right? So it's really the language of the people, the identity of the people, any people, really. The Middle High German period was also a very important 
for the development of the German language simply because this was a time when Germany expanded eastward. So areas that are part of Germany today, eastern, the eastern part of Germany, uh, roughly where East Germany used to be the country of East Germany, right? Uh, those areas during the time of Charlemagne were actually inhabited by Slavic people, people who had moved in as Germanic people moved out, Slavic people moved in, and there's still some remnants of Slavic people in that area, actually. We do have uh, Slavic minorities in Germany who had lived there for over a thousand years. So Germans started to push into these areas. And one of the excuses, if you will, that they used for doing that is that it was actually a sort of a crusade, right? This was also the time of the crusades uh, against heathens, if you will, in the Middle East to take the Holy Land from people who were not Christians, right? But at the same time, they did that in Europe as well. They they pushed against people who had not been converted yet. Charlemagne did the same thing to Germanic people, actually. He did that to the Saxons, those Saxons who had not moved to Britain, those Saxons who remained in northern Germany, who spoke low German dialects, and they were subjugated and, and brutally forced to take on Christianity, to, to accept Christianity as their official religion. And we see that now happening in that Middle High German period and during the Middle Ages uh, with, with, with Germans doing that to Eastern Europeans, Central Eastern Europeans. And you may have all heard of the Knights Templars. Now, the Knights Templars were one of several orders of basically armed monks. And there was a German version of that. And those were called the Teutonic Knights. Or in German, we just call them Deutsche Ritterorden, which literally means German Knights Order, right? Now, the Teutonic Knights did not only fight in the Crusades in the Middle East, they also fought their own Crusades against heathens or non-Christians in what is today the Baltic States and Northern Poland. And they established their own state in those areas. And why is that important? Guess what? One of the Baltic people that lived in that area, people who were closely related to Lithuanians and Latvians, who spoke a language that was very similar to that, were the original Prussians. So the original Prussians weren't German. But when the Teutonic Knights created their own more or less ecclesiastic state in those areas, they eventually took on the name of the Prussians. And that was the very, very origin of the German Prussians. So German knights who lived like monks, but more or less, we think, they claim, uh, conquer these areas, take them away from heathens, force people into Christianity, bring in a bunch of people from Germany to settle in these areas, and then eventually call themselves by the name of one of those people that they conquered, the Prussians. Interestingly enough, the state of the Teutonic Knights was never part of the Holy Roman Empire. It was just too far outside of it. So they were kind of doing their own thing over there. This brings us into the early New High German period, which lasted roughly from 1350 to 1650. Several important things happened during that time period. One was that Johann Gutenberg, another German, invented the movable type printing press. So now all of a sudden you could relatively cheaply and relatively quickly print the same document the same sheet of paper with words on them which took a long time to copy by hand before and of course you know people started to experiment with new ways to make paper and things like that so all of a sudden we now have a relatively fast or much much quicker way to create documents with words on them and then in the 16th century, something else happened. 
Now, Martin Luther was not the only person who pushed for reformation, but this was the great time of reformation. Martin Luther was certainly the most important reformers. Uh, he could be credited with the Protestant movement, if you will. Anyway, so, so Martin Luther, who was actually a Roman Catholic monk at first, decided to proclaim that the Catholic Church is not really doing what, what the church was intended to be. And one of the important things when it comes to language was that Martin Luther said that all Christians should be able to read Holy Scripture by themselves. And not in Latin or Greek or some other foreign language, but in their own language. So this is a time period when people really got into translating Holy Scripture, the Bible, or books contained in the Bible, and some other ones as well, into Vulgate languages, into the language of the people, into Deutsch. So if you were a follower of Martin Luther, if you were a Reformed Christian, you would want to read. If you didn't know how to read, you had a very, very, very strong reason now to learn how to read. During this period of early New High German, or actually towards the end of it, maybe marking the end of it, was one of the most catastrophic events in German history, the Thirty Year War, a war that lasted 30 years, obviously. So this was really the culmination of the fight of those people who wanted to reform Christianity, Protestants, and the Roman Catholic Church. A very large percentage of people who lived in the Holy Roman Empire died during those times, not just in warfare, but indirectly through basically their villages or their, their towns being burned down and then plundered, people being left out in the cold because somebody stole their food and clothes. And you can imagine that these roving armies, that, that armies that not only came from other parts of Germany, but also from Sweden and from France and other areas, uh, carried with them also diseases. And these people did not exactly live under very sanitary conditions, especially not by modern standards. So you can imagine, you know, diseases running rampant in those areas and people being treated horribly. So the year 1650 roughly serves as the beginning of New High German, or the period of New High German. And this area started out really not well for, for the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, uh, a couple of things happened, obviously with the Thirty Year War, the entire area became really weakened and depopulated. The Netherlands decided to break off, so they became their own country. So the people of the Netherlands, the modern day country of the Netherlands, who spoke a low Germanic dialect, very similar to the old language of the old Saxons, right? and and. Uh, closely related to English, actually, decided they're going to be no longer part of that Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. They're going to do their own thing. And good for them. They actually flourished. They did really well for themselves. The Netherlands is one of the most successful countries of the modern world, really. And they decided they have their own language. That's why they don't speak German, even though we refer to them as the Dutch, which sounds kind of like Deutsch, right? But anyway, so uh, yeah, that's why the Netherlands has its own language, which is closely related to German and to English, but its own language. They broke off linguistically, not only politically, but also linguistically. So with the Holy Roman Empire being severely weakened, uh, the French, basically the, 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 the descendants of the West Frankish Empire and that the part of the West, the part of the Frankish realm that actually took on the name of the Franks. France basically means the realm of the Franks. They now were encouraged to start chipping away from the Holy Roman Empire. And on the other end, in the East, we have the Turks chipping away from especially the Habsburg Empire, the basically what is Austria today. Austria back then was part of the Holy Roman Empire as well. And with the French becoming so powerful, of course, a lot of Germans looked towards the West for, for 
prestige. They sometimes allied themselves with the French king. They uh, took upon themselves to be more like the French. Uh, this is a time period when every duke and baron in the Holy Roman Empire tried to build for themselves a little version of the Versailles Palace outside of France, the one that uh, Louis XIV built for himself. So just outside of Munich, where I grew up, there are actually two perfect examples of that. We have Nymphenburg and Oberschleißheim. They both were designed to be basically, yeah, copies of, of Versailles or, or mini Versailles. People wanted to establish themselves and very much competed with the French in trying to be more French than the French sometimes. French also as a language of diplomacy, of, of the sciences, of literature became very, very important. Eventually there was a pushback against not only the French influences, but also the influences or, or the culture of the rational enlightenment. So in Germany, this marks the beginning of the Sturm und Drang period. Translated loosely into English, that would be storm and push period, which sounds kind of militaristic, but it's not at all. It's actually almost the opposite of militaristic German ideals. Uh, so Sturm und Drang is a period that is associated with very famous German authors like Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Friedrich Schiller, Friedrich Schlegel, Arthur Schopenhauer, they were more or less part of that and then others were as well. And this was a time period when people started to embrace nature and feelings and emotions, when people no longer held back and people uh, were, were venerating nature. Instead of seeing nature as the enemy, they really thought nature as an expression of deity, of, 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 of the divine. So you can see that this was sort of the beginning of the environmental movement, which is really strong in Germany today. Germans love their forests. They love going hiking in the mountains and in the forest. And this is kind of the time period when this really became popular and also popularized through literature and expressed in literature. A lot of very important things happened at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. First of all, the United States of America broke free from English rule. They founded their own country based on, well, early forms of democracy, maybe not by our own standards today, but, uh, you know, a dramatic departure from how things were run back then. Then we have the French Revolution shortly after, the French rising up against their own king, beheading their own king, and... Uh, establishing a republic. And we have Napoleon Bonaparte, a non-noble, ascending to the, the, the head of the republic and then crowning himself emperor of France. Kind of like a new Charlemagne in a way. By the way, this is also the time period when the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation ended in large part because of Napoleon's warfare, Napoleon's attempt to basically conquer all of Europe. Beginning with the late Middle Ages, Northern Germany became more and more important. And the Teutonic Knights established themselves as their own little realm over there in the Eastern Baltic were one of the reasons for that. The Hanseatic League was another reason for that. These people became very wealthy, very influential. Some of them were dealing within the Holy Roman Empire. Some were also outside of the Holy Roman Empire. So starting with the late Middle Ages up until modern times, standard German kind of moved northward. And it never became, it was never replaced by a low German dialect, but the dialect that is spoken by people in north central modern day germany really is considered standard german today so it's no longer the dialect spoken up and down the rhine river but really the areas that are now 
southern Lower Saxony, northern Hessen, and also maybe the state of Thuringia. So northern Germany became more and more powerful, and eventually the Prussians became the most dominant, the, 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 the most important, the most powerful realm within Germany. Not just outside of the Holy Roman Empire, but within Germany. And they became the main competitors to the Austrians. So after the Holy Roman Empire ceased to exist, uh, and after Napoleon was defeated and Waterloo and was no longer an issue, Germany tried to redefine itself and really broke into two realms. The Austrian realm, which really became partly German or German-speaking, but also really a multi-ethnic large empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then the other part, which was dominated by the Prussians. After Prussia's victory in the Franco-Prussian War, Germany reunites as a country under Prussian dominance. And the kings of Prussia are now the emperors of Germany. This is the second empire, if you will. After World War I, when Prussia ceased to exist, when the Austrian lineage of the Habsburg Empire also ceased to exist, when a lot of territories that were administered, that were controlled by either the Habsburg or the Hohenzollern family were cut off and given to other countries and where other countries were actually formed, like we see the beginning of Czechoslovakia, Austria in its current boundaries starts to exist. Uh, a lot of areas that were controlled in Eastern Europe by the Prussians are now given to a new country that, that is revitalized, that, that is reborn, and that is the country of Poland, which had been torn apart by, on the one hand, the Russians, and on the other hand, the Prussians. And now we have Poland reborn out of the ashes, like a phoenix out of the ashes. The defeat of Nazi Germany at the end of World War II also ends the importance of German as a prominent language that was spoken all over East Central Europe. There were many, many different pockets of ethnic Germans that had settled in different areas over the centuries and uh, for, for various reasons. And a lot of those people, either willingly or not willingly, moved to areas that were then the occupied parts of Germany. Large parts of what was Eastern Germany, basically Prussia, Eastern Prussia, uh, was given to Poland and large parts of what was Poland at the end of World War II were given to the Soviet Union. A lot of ethnic Germans, most ethnic Germans from areas of Eastern Europe moved either to Austria or to Germany and or to the Germanies. Of course, there was an East Germany and a West Germany. And while there were two Germanies, also the language kind of diverged a little bit. There were certain terms that East Germans were using that West Germans were not using. So we had a state that was influenced heavily by the Soviet Union and another state that was heavily influenced by, yeah, mostly the United States of America. And there are a lot, a lot of English terms that found their way into German everyday language. And then there are some terms that sound English, but that are of German creation, like for instance, the word for cell phone, which is handy, which is a word that nobody else uses it's a it's basically a marketing ploy it's a it's a it's a name for anyways today german is spoken by roughly 100 million people as a native language it is a language that keeps evolving that keeps assimilating keeps absorbing influences from other languages most recently of course mostly english this concludes my attempt to summarize the history of the German language. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this was somewhat interesting. Please feel free to leave your comments and your questions below. I would love to hear what people 
think and uh, also a lot of things that I have left out, things that I may not even be aware of, please feel free to add that in your comments. Thanks for watching. Take care.